Today on the Matt Wall Show, the Kamala campaign built their whole strategy around celebrity endorsements. It paid off with a crushing defeat, of course, but why are celebrity endorsements so useless now, if not actually counterproductive? We'll talk about that. Also, what's the latest on Trump's criminal cases now that he's president-elect? And the media is in the middle of a historic week for news, but still they find the time to attack me for my mean tweets. We'll talk about all that and more today on the Matt Wall Show. After a great week, why not spend the weekend watching the left squirm a little bit more? My film, Am I Racist? The number one documentary of the decade is streaming exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. Not a member yet? Head over to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code Trump for 47% off your new annual membership. Going online without ExpressVPN, it's like driving without car insurance. You might be a great driver, but with all the crazy people on the roads these days, why would you take that risk? Every time you connect to public Wi-Fi, whether it's at a coffee shop, hotel, airport, Your personal data is completely exposed. And while the left wants you to think the biggest threat to your privacy is coming from the government, the reality is that any random hacker on those networks can steal your passwords, your bank logins, your credit card details. And here's the truly disturbing part. doesn't even take much technical knowledge to do this. Some cheap hardware is all they need. We're talking about something so simple a 12-year-old could do it. These hackers can make up to $1,000 per person selling your information on the dark web. That's why I use ExpressVPN. It creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the internet, making it impossible for hackers to steal your data. We're talking about encryption so strong, it would take a supercomputer over a billion years to crack, and it couldn't be easier to use. You just open the app, click one button, and you're protected. ExpressVPN works on all your devices, phones, laptops, tablets, everything. I use it myself whenever I'm traveling for speaking events. There's a reason it's rated number one by top tech reviewers like CNET and The Verge. So secure your online data today by visiting expressvpn.com slash Walsh. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N.com slash Walsh. You can get extra three months free, expressvpn.com slash Walsh. There was a mildly successful commercial back in 2016 where LeBron James was promoting Sprite. Uh, He keeps looking into the camera and saying, I won't tell you to drink a Sprite, It's supposed to be engaging and funny because you see normally when celebrities appear in advertisements, they tell you to buy a product. But here you had LeBron James appearing in a Sprite commercial, refusing to endorse Sprite. So it really subverted everyone's expectations. Uh, Reverse psychology like this has become popular in advertising because the typical direct, straightforward celebrity endorsement doesn't have the same impact that it once did. This is also why the idea of reverse endorsements, so-called, has become a thing. This is when a company puts a celebrity on its board of directors to make them seem really invested in the company when it's basically a no-show job. Derek Jeter had a reverse endorsement deal with a company called Revolution Wear that makes some kind of high-tech underwear. I don't know how underwear can be high-tech, but it is. And it all fell apart and ended in lawsuits uh, when the company collapsed because the world of high-tech underwear is apparently extremely cutthroat. But the point is, this underwear company thought they'd get more value out of presenting Derek Jeter as a director of the company rather than just going with the normal direct celebrity endorsement. There are about a million other examples of this because the memo has gone out. In the entertainment world, traditional celebrity endorsements aren't as interesting as they used to be. So if you want a celebrity to have an impact, you have to get creative with it. And even then, most people probably still won't care. The only people who haven't gotten this memo are in politics. Political endorsements by celebrities are all the same. They're unconvincing, uncreative, patronizing. And yet, for some reason, pundits and political strategists on the left genuinely believe that these endorsements are game-changing. They think that once the normal person hears one of these endorsements, they undergo a form of mind control where they're hopeless to resist. So I, I played part of this clip a couple of days ago, but it's worth replaying because it may be the single best reaction video from MSNBC after they realized that Trump was winning. This is Joy Reid trying to process how Trump could have possibly defeated Kamala Harris. After all, Kamala Harris ran a flawless campaign. And as evidence of the proposition that Kamala Harris ran a flawless campaign, Joy Reid cites all of Kamala Harris's celebrity endorsements. This is footage that belongs in a museum somewhere for future historians studying the downfall of the Democrat Party and the corporate press. Uh, Watch. 
And I think it's important to say that, you know, anyone who has experienced or been in the United States for any period of time and experienced this country's history and knows it cannot have believed that it would be easy to elect a woman president, let alone a woman of color. Mm -hmm. Let's just be clear. Mm -hmm. And nothing that was true yesterday about how flawlessly this campaign was run is not true now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this really was an historic flawlessly run campaign. She had, Queen Latifah never endorses anyone. She came out and endorsed, you know, I mean, we, she had every prominent celebrity voice. She had the, she had the, uh, the Taylor Swifties, she had the Swifties, she had the Beehive. Like you could not have run a better campaign in that short period of time. And I think that's still true. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to consider in that clip, but um, I mean, really at this point, you can't be mad at Joy Reid. Everyone knows that she is what we may call politely a very, special person. What's kind of remarkable is that everybody else on the panel, people who are extremely partisan, but not totally clinically insane, maybe not, just not along when she makes this claim. She's suggesting that a political endorsement by Queen Latifah is so rare and enigmatic that if a candidate should ever obtain it, then that candidate must be blessed by the gods. That candidate is, is destined to win. I mean, maybe it makes sense at you know, a certain level. She is royalty after all. But that was a moment that should have been a bridge too far, even for an MSNBC panel. For one thing, the premise isn't even true. We're talking about the same Queen Latifah who performed at Obama's inauguration after telling people to vote for hope and change. Then she did a skit with Kamala Harris just a few months ago at the NAACP Image Awards, telling everyone to register to vote because otherwise Trump will win. Yes, this is the Queen Latifah that supposedly never gets involved in politics. But on top of that, even if we pretend Queen Latifah never gets involved in politics, the idea that her endorsements will sway anyone or that it's a sign of a flawless campaign suggests that Democrats are suffering from a level of delusion that is truly unprecedented. And that becomes even more apparent when you look at this vaunted Queen Latifah endorsement that they're talking about. She just sits in a chair and instead of talking about makeup, she reads off some talking points from Kamala Harris's campaign. Uh, watch. Yeah, that looks good. Oh, yeah, that's how I want to look when I vote. Fly. Exactly. Because you know what? Mm -hmm. This is going to be amazing. How's that looking, Roz? Yeah, I like it. I think it looks good. You want the same color lip queen or gloss? All right. Whatever looks good when I vote. I want voting. I want the color of vote. I want the color of freedom. Hey, can you fly me in a little bit of agency? Yeah, thank you. And I might just need a touch up just over here, uh, a little bit of mind your business and a touch of, I'm a woman, let me control my own body. Just right there, yeah. Oh, I was thinking maybe 50,000. So you get the idea. There's Queen Latifah. Um, that, I don't know, I'm, I'm with Joy Reid. I don't know how that didn't, how did that not totally, that should have been, that should have been decisive. That should have been the end of the election right there. Once you get that video, uh, how, how did that not? How did that not get the Rust Belt voters to 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 uh, flood to the polls um, in favor of Kamala Harris? You know, one of the many amusing things about this video, uh, or actually the only amusing thing about it, is the comment section and how it differs depending on the platform. So if you go on Instagram, a lot of the comments are pretty supportive. Plenty of uh, people hosting heart emojis and stuff like that, saying it's a powerful message and Queen Latifah is their hero and so on. One person wrote. I'm going to always love you, Queen Latifah. Never change. Then you go on X, and it's a completely different scenario. It's like stepping out of a country club and into the Vietnam War. The top comment is, did you go to the Diddy parties too? The next one is, how much were you paid? And then there's another weak man for Kamala. It's just, it's brutal, if also hilarious and completely justified too. It's yet another reason the left wants to destroy X, by the way. People on X generally reflect kind of the mood of the country certainly a lot more than on other platforms. But if you spend all of your time on Reddit or Instagram, you might end up like Joy Reid. You might have thought that Kamala Harris had this in the bag. After all, Queen Latifah's on her side. Everyone else on the platform loves it. And then you go on X and everybody's, you know, wondering how much she was paid and whether she was at the Diddy parties. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying Queen Latifah was paid for this endorsement. I would never suggest such a thing. But in general, uh, it is worth noting that the Kamala Harris campaign raised something like a billion dollars and they ended the campaign in debt by $20 million. They raised a billion and were in debt 
by 20 million at the end. They had $120 million in the bank a month ago, and now they're in the red. And a lot of that money probably did go to some celebrity performances and endorsements, like the one Megan Thee Stallion did at a Kamala rally. But in any event, it's clear that this was a horribly managed campaign in every respect. So it's not exactly unthinkable that these people truly thought an endorsement by Queen Latifah would help them win. They really seem to think that people wanted to see stuff like that. And that would explain why they courted the endorsement also of Cardi B, who's so illiterate that it actually caused problems for the campaign. Mid-endorsement, her teleprompter went out, so she couldn't say anything until someone ran up uh, with a phone containing her prepared statement. We played this video a couple days ago, but it's, it's fun playing again. Uh, here it is. One second, guys, one second. Okay, so I don't take lightly the call. Sorry, guys, I'm a little nervous. I'm a little nervous, guys. I've been waiting for this moment this whole life, my whole life. I need patience over here. Patience, where are She's been waiting for that moment her whole life. She's been waiting for the moment to... Uh, self-destruct on stage at a campaign rally? Maybe, is that what you meant? Or that was she, she's been waiting for Kamala Harris her whole life. Weren't we all? Now you have to wonder again who this is supposed to impress. I mean, even if she had read all of that perfectly, who exactly is supposed to care about this? What demographic are they targeting? Whatever they were going for, it didn't work. Pretty much the only demographic group that Kamala Harris won on Tuesday, according to exit polls, was the same group that Joy Reid belongs to, black women. She won by uh, black women by something like 92%. It's a 2% improvement from Joe Biden two years ago. But both of those numbers are actually low by Democrat standards. Obama got more than 95% of uh, the black woman vote for, uh, back in, uh, when, when he ran. Hillary Clinton got 94%. So if anything, there's some evidence that endorsements like this aren't really helping even among Democrats' most loyal constituency. Now, The Guardian certainly seems to think that there's a good chance that these endorsements aren't helping uh, anymore. They just ran a big article that explores the question of why all these celebrities, from Bruce Springsteen to George Clooney to Taylor Swift, Beyonce, uh, why they may have actually been counterproductive. Quote, a poll from YouGov shortly after Taylor Swift's endorsement found that only 8% of voters would be somewhat or much more likely to vote for Harris, with a surprising 20% saying the endorsement actually made them less likely to vote for her. Yes, as we talked about at the time, Taylor Swift's endorsement might have made people less likely to support Kamala. And there's evidence that this took the Harris campaign by surprise. The article also states that, quote, back in July, Charlie XCX posted a three-word tweet that some commentators thought might help swing the U.S. election. Arriving the day after Kamala Harris announced her bid for the presidency, Charlie's tweet said simply, Kamala is brat. It was a reference to Charlie's latest album, Brat, which had dominated the pop cultural landscape. The overall meaning was clear. Kamala was the presidential candidate with the most energy and authenticity. The Harris campaign leaned into the endorsement, changing the backdrop of its official X page to the same garish green color used on the record sleeve. Yet, as the dust settles on an extremely depressing election result, it, I mean, not depressing for me, but you know, not for us, but I guess for them, it appears clearly that not only did Charlie XCX's tweet have no meaningful impact on the election result, nor did the, the endorsement of any other celebrity. So this was a big problem for Kamala because to the extent she had a campaign strategy at all, it hinged almost entirely on this, on celebrity endorsements. Kamala was endorsed by all of the most famous celebrities in Hollywood and the music industry. And this was her whole campaign was just showing off the celebrities who endorsed her. And it paid off with a crushing and historic defeat. So why might that be? Well, unlike the panel on MSNBC, uh, I'll, I'll answer that question. For one thing, as I mentioned earlier, celebrity endorsements in general just aren't that effective anymore. But they're especially ineffective right now when in inflation is high and people are struggling to afford uh, you know, essentials like groceries. In an economic environment like that, Americans just aren't interested in sermons from obscenely wealthy entertainers. Not that they're all that interested even in a good economy. But the other problem is that the power of celebrity in general has been massively watered down in recent years. There are just so many of them that even the biggest ones like Taylor Swift or Beyonce 
just don't have the kind of culture-changing impact that, say, Michael Jackson or Elvis uh, would have had decades ago. I mean, when a woman can become famous by saying hak tua, the whole concept of a celebrity loses a lot of its luster. This has been obvious to almost everyone for some time, which is why a lot of celebrities have found new ways to endorse products like those reverse endorsement deals that I mentioned. But apparently it wasn't obvious to the Kamala Harris campaign. They believed in all seriousness that amassing a bunch of these vapid cookie cutter endorsements from famous people would win them the election. They thought Americans cared so little about substance that they'd vote for a candidate who can barely articulate a coherent thought all because of the endorsements of some other morons who also can't articulate coherent thoughts. After what happened on Tuesday, there's just no one, except maybe MSNBC anchors, who seriously thinks that these celebrities have any sway over anyone anymore. Now let's get to our five headlines. You know, we talk a lot about putting our money where our values are. Well, let me tell you about my cell phone company, Pure Talk, and why I made the switch. Pure Talk is veteran-led, and they don't just talk about supporting our veterans. They actually do something about it. They've already alleviated $10 million in veteran debt. Every month, they donate tens of thousands to prevent veteran suicide. And they just gave $50,000 to Mike Rowe Works to help veteran, uh, veterans learn trades after serving our country. Meanwhile, what exactly are Verizon, AT&T, and T-Mobile doing with your money. Pure Talk gives the exact same coverage, America's most dependable 5G network, for half the cost. You get better service, better values, and you're helping our veterans. It's that simple. Right now, Pure Talk has an incredible offer for my listeners. When you switch to uh, your service over to Pure Talk on a qualifying plan, you'll get one year free of Daily Wire Insider, completely free, where you can stream my new film, Am I Racist? But remember, the deal is exclusive. The only way to get it is by going to puretalk.com slash Walsh. Support Pure Talk, a wireless company who wants to be a wireless company and nothing more. Remember, it takes courage to stand for your values and takes even more to stand against those who try to silence you. PureTalk.com slash Walsh. That's PureTalk.com slash Walsh. Fox News has a report about Trump's case in New York now that uh, now that he's now that he's won the election, what's happening with his uh, criminal cases. Um, it says, it's reading now says, following his massive election victory, President-elect Trump is still scheduled for sentencing in his Manhattan criminal case later this month with presiding judge Juan Merchan First ruling whether to dismiss the charges altogether after the Supreme Court's presidential immunity ruling earlier this year. Trump was found guilty of 34 counts of falsifying business records. Uh, Trump is scheduled for sentencing on November 26th, which is already a four-month delay from the original date of July 11th. Trump's lawyers has said that uh, has asked the judge to overturn the former president's guilty verdict in New York. Uh, in New York v. Trump, at, after the Supreme Court ruled in July that former presidents have substantial immunity from prosecution for official acts in office, but not for unofficial acts. Merchan is expected to rule by November 12th as to where the charges stand. Um, Carly Stimson, Deputy Director of the Heritage Foundation, uh, Edwin Meese III, Center for Legal and Judicial Studies, says a normal judge would dismiss this case, and then the DA would have to decide what, if anything, remains so that we could consider rebringing the case. But Judge Merchan has shown himself to be anything but an ordinary judge. And so the catch-22 here is if he was normal, he would dismiss it, but because he's not normal, he'll probably deny it. Um, for all intents and purposes, no matter what happens, if the judge denies it and the appeals court follow the judge and the judge gets to sentence him, even then the Justice Department will come in and say, look, under the, Supreme, on these, under the Supremacy Clause, you cannot impose a criminal sentence, especially one of incarceration, on a sitting president. And so that case will be on ice until after Trump gets out of office. So in other words, the case is effectively over. I mean, that's, that's my speculation anyway. Um, Meanwhile, the federal cases are also basically finished. NPR reports, Donald Trump started this year fighting two federal prosecutions that threatened to send him in prison, but he will end it free and clear of his most significant criminal legal problems. Um, with his resounding victory at the polls and a longstanding Justice Department policy against prosecuting a sitting president, the key question is not if, but when prosecutors move to dismiss or delay his federal election interference case in Washington, D.C. Uh Trump recently said he would fire special counsel Jack Smith within two seconds after he returned to the White House. Smith is taking steps to end both federal cases against Trump before the president-elect takes office. So those are out the window. Um, Trump could just pardon himself on the federal charges anyway, so it's, it's a non-issue. I have heard some speculation from conservatives that maybe they would still try to continue with 
uh, some of these criminal cases somehow, but you know, maybe they would try to throw a sitting president in prison or something, but that's not going to happen. Uh, they're already in the process of abandoning these cases, and that only just proves what the perceptive among us already knew, which is that these criminal cases were never really criminal cases. I mean, they were criminal cases on paper, uh, and they had crimes that they were charging them with, absurd crimes on paper, but in reality, they weren't really trying him for a, a crime uh, because the crime was that he was running for president. That, that was the crime as far as they were concerned. These cases existed to prevent him from winning again and really for no other reason. That was the only point of any of them. Um, it was never really about throwing him in jail. I mean, sure, they would have happily done that if they could, but that wasn't the point. It wasn't the primary objective. Uh, the primary objective wasn't even to win the cases, which is why people were kind of missing the point where they were saying, well, these charges are flimsy. It's, it can't stand up in court. It doesn't matter. Sending him to jail, winning the case, getting a conviction, those were all secondary benefits. They'll take that if they can get it, but it's not really the point. The point was just to sully him enough politically that he could not win the presidency again. So they were building a political case, not a criminal one. And uh, we see how that worked out. And, you know, it's kind of funny that the, the general view on the right, I, I think, is that the criminal cases backfired politically and ended up being one of the reasons why Trump won. Um, instead of people being turned off uh, from Trump because of the cases, they were more motivated to vote for him. That's kind of the, that's what you'll hear from a lot of people on the right. But I, I think that's not actually what happened. I, I, um, I think that obviously the, the, the plot didn't work, trying to use these criminal cases to destroy his political chances. That didn't work. I also don't know that it backfired, though, in that sense. I think that I think it just had no political impact at all, one way or another. So in other words, Trump would have won just as big even if they never put him on trial. If none of that ever happened, I think the results would be the same. I think he still would have crushed. Um, I mean, I could be wrong. Who knows? We can't, we can't go back and do it again differently, but... I tend to think his victory would have been the same even without the lawfare against him uh, because the lawfare proved to just have no impact. It didn't matter at all in any way. It's, it's like it never happened. And I think that in some ways is, that's the worst fate for the people waging this lawfare against him. For the prosecutors and the DAs involved in all this, the worst fate is that they didn't matter at all. Uh, it just doesn't like it's a. It ends up being not even a footnote in the history books. It just does. It's a, it's a total non-issue. Um, Americans were completely uninterested, unmoved, bored with the whole thing. And uh, to me, that's the most poetic justice of all. E even more than it backfiring, I think even better, even more delicious uh, is that it just didn't. It's like didn't matter. We, it was, didn't matter one way or another. Um, I find that to be pretty fantastic. Well, we've been focused on the national election results, but there was uh, plenty of good news on the local level, too. Post Millennial has this report. A California anti-crime ballot measure that would reclassify some misdemeanor theft and drug crimes as felonies got overwhelming support on Tuesday as voters moved to slowly restore law and order following years of failed progressive policies. State Proposition 36 passed in a landslide after receiving widespread backing from voters on Election Day, with 70.6% of the 7.6 million ballots counted in favor of the initiative, according to unofficial results from the California Secretary of State's office. Despite Democrat Governor Gavin Newsom's opposition to the measure, with, which authorizes felony charges for possession of drugs like fentanyl and thefts under $950 if the offender has at least two similar prior convictions, California residents have expressed their desire for change, beginning with restoring public safety. Um, uh, meanwhile, in addition to this passing, uh, Los Angeles County voters ousted Soros-backed progressive district attorney George Gascon on Election Day. And uh, so he's also out. So I certainly don't think that California will now become some sort of haven for 
law and order. Uh, it, it still has a lot of problems, but this is very significant. Voters, even in California, overwhelmingly said that they want to retreat from the progressive, soft-on-crime approach. They want more law and more order. Uh, they want to punish crime again. And I mean, how do you explain that? Who are you going to blame if you're on the left? Is it racism again? Are the voters in California racist? A huge number of them, obviously, aren't even white. So these were, these were in large part non-white people in non-white communities saying that they want more law enforcement and more punishment of law-breaking in their communities. And why do they want that? Well, because the alternative is chaos. The alternative is despair. The alternative makes their lives a whole lot worse, which is what these people were experiencing. And this is the basic truth of leftist policy that we've seen play out again and again. It, it does not work in the real world. Like It's just that simple. It doesn't work in reality. Uh, sounds good in theory, doesn't actually work in reality. Now, I, I don't think it sounds good even in theory, personally. I don't, I don't think it sounds good at all. Um, doesn't sound good to me. The leftist policies don't sound good to me, even in theory. But to a lot of people in the general population, at least in states like California, uh, I guess it, it does at first sound good on paper to them. Like in the abstract, some of these people find it appealing. And that's how things like the defund the police movement get off the ground. People, some people hear about it. And at first they say, yeah, police are scary. Let's replace them with social workers. That's, uh, that's, that's, I mean, police are shooting a lot of people. And so if we have, if we replace them with other people who don't have guns and aren't going to shoot people, then fewer people will be shot. And that's good. So that's the way the, the logic goes in their minds, I guess. Now, again, even in theory, that sounds like a terrible idea to me, and it sounds like a terrible idea to you, but if you have a certain mindset and you don't think about the issue for more than five seconds, I guess it appeals to you. But then they do it, and they put it in action, and the results speak for themselves. The results are always the same. Uh, they make people's lives worse. They bring misery and despair. Those are the results of leftist policies, misery and despair which is why they are only supported, again, by people who don't think about them deeply enough and, and consider them only in theory, and also by people, the elites, who, who uh, know that, that the pol they, you know, for these elites who put these policies in place, they know that the policies will breed misery and despair, but they also know that they personally will not suffer those consequences. So it's the classic thing where you have leftists and gated communities who support defunding the police and Soros prosecutors and bail reform and all of that for the poor communities that they don't live in. Same story over and over again. All right, here's a story. If we could just have one that isn't election related for a change, um, at least might not be. I don't know. But this, to me, it seems like a big, I don't know, it just, it seems like something everybody should know about. I, I have not seen very much reporting on it, but it seems like kind of a big deal. Call me crazy. Uh, 40 monkeys have escaped from a research facility in South Carolina. So that, that's a real thing that's happening in America right now, as far as I know. I think this is real. I don't think it's an elaborate hoax. Uh, here's the report. 40 monkeys that escaped from the Alpha Genesis facility in Yemisee. WJCL 22 News' is Kyron Naveau live in the low country, keeping his head on a swivel with those primates on the run. And, of course, this is a public safety alert. Kai, what is the latest on these missing monkeys? Well, Frank, good morning. So, yeah, like you mentioned, 40 monkeys escaped from the Alpha Genesis facility. It happened around 945 last night, and police are asking anyone to just, if they see them, to stay away. And that's why we're here at the municipal complex here in Yemisee. But here's what police are doing right now to find those monkeys. So, like I mentioned, it happened nine, 40 monkeys escaped 945 last night. And currently, police have placed traps all around the area to capture those monkeys. Now, so far, I have no idea what those traps actually look like. And we're trying to get more information about that. But police are also using 
utilizing on-site thermal imaging cameras in an attempt to locate these monkeys. Now, the monkeys are used at the facility for biomedical research. And this isn't the first time those monkeys actually escaped from the Alpha Genesis facility. Back in 2016, 19 monkeys made a break from the compound, but they were all captured about six hours later. Now, residents are being asked to lock their doors, lock their windows, and if they see these monkeys, they just stay away and call police. Now, we're trying to make some contact with the local police here to get any update on if they captured any, captured any but so far, we have not heard back. Live in Yemen, I'm Kyra Navo. Back to you, Frank. All right, Kai, again, good update, good news. If you see a monkey, if one comes to your door, don't answer it. Call 911. Don't answer it if there's a monkey knocking on your door. That's a good That's a good. Uh, good advice. I like how the, the reporter says he's trying to find out what the traps look like. We need to, because they set all these traps out for the monkeys, and we don't know what the traps look like. And I guess you need to know that so that you don't accidentally end up in one of the traps. I mean, if you if you live in South Carolina and you see like a banana under a box being held up by a stick, uh, don't don't go. Don't I, bananas are delicious, but don't don't uh, don't go try to grab that banana. Um, so this is a this is a bio lab, a research lab, and forty monkeys that they were using for research are now on the loose. I mean, this is. Literally the beginning of like three different apocalypse movies. Okay, this is, uh, what is this? Maybe more than three. Three come to mind. There's, this is Outbreak, 28 Days Later, and Planet of the Apes. So those are our options. That's what's, that, pick, pick your poison. Like door uh, one, two, or three here for how this ends up. So you've got a fatal disease, uh, a zombie outbreak, or monkeys take over the world. That's that. I think if I had to choose between those options, I'd take the Planet of the Apes apocalypse of if I if we get to choose. How does he, how does it happen? How do you lose track of forty monkeys? Is my question. And it does. It feels like I'm not trying to scare anybody, but it 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 feels like another one of those things where you hear the story and you go. Wait a minute. 40 disease monkeys are running loose. That isn't this a really bad thing? Isn't this a really, really bad? Shouldn't we? And you say that, and then all the, the, the media and the experts say, oh no, it's not. Don't worry about it. It's it's fine. If you see the monkey, don't go anywhere. Don't go within a hundred yards of the monkey. But don't worry about it. It's not, it's totally fine. Um so it feels like one of those things where they tell us that it's it's fine, nothing to worry about. And uh turns out that, oh no, it's like you know, Nothing to worry about except the end of the world is, was the only thing. So I don't know. And look, I'm not, this is not a conspiracy theory. I'm not saying anything. I'm not accusing anyone of anything. I'm just, it's weird timing. So right when Trump was in the process of winning is when the 40 monkeys are somehow escape from the lab. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how that happens. I, I, it's, it's weird timing. It's a, it's a coincidental timing. It's a heck of a coincidence. Um, so who knows, but look out for the monkeys. If you're in South Carolina, I want to play this. We've, um, had some fun on the show playing these videos of leftists melting down over the election results. And it's a lot of fun, good old fashioned, wholesome fun. And, uh, Here's one more. It might be the best one, but it's more of a it's a prequel. This is a this is a video before the meltdown. Okay, this is before the storm hits. This is a woman, a political analyst, she proudly tells us, at about 5 p.m. on election night, or about three hours before the 40 disease monkeys were let loose in America. Uh, and she's still feeling great, feeling confident. And she decided to make and post this video uh, right, right at that moment. Let's watch. Okay, so we're closing in on almost 5 p.m. Eastern time, and I've been tracking everything that's been going on across the country today. And my most important encounter was when I <laughs> went out to get my champagne. Uh, I was talking to the guy in the store, of course, uh, asking him did he vote and he said he did early voting and he asked me if I early voted uh, 
and uh, he asked me, you know, why I was getting the champagne. And I said, because I'm going to be toasting Madam President tonight. And he just looked at me with kind of like a smirk on his face. And I said, you know, she's she's going to win this, right? And he says, oh, well, it's very, very close. And I said, no, it's not. He says, well, what do you mean? I said, no, it's not. The women of America are making their voices heard. Reproductive rights is what it all comes down to. And the women are voting in numbers relative to men that are unbelievable. She's won this. And I said to him, she's going to take every one of the swing states plus Ohio plus Iowa. And he said, oh, but the numbers are so close. I said, I'm a political analyst. I'm telling you right now, the numbers are there. She's taking this election. And then I said to him, you realize, and he didn't tell me who he voted for, but of course I knew. And I said, you do realize you wasted your vote, right? (laughs) And I didn't care. And I walked out with my bottle of champagne and happily walked home. (laughs) Bye-bye. <laughs> well, she was right about one thing. It wasn't close. Um, she uh, she nailed that. By the way, if you're, if you're just listening to the audio podcast and you're not seeing the video and you have an image in your mind of what that woman looks like, that's it. You're right. That's exactly that. It's exactly the exact image you have in your mind. The only thing you're wrong about is that you expect her to have purple hair. And surprisingly, she doesn't. Um, I don't think she did. I'm kind of colorblind. Other than that, it's everything. It's exactly what you think. And, um, and, but she, she did say that it wouldn't be close and she got that right. Nailed that. She is a political analyst after all, which, which is such a funny thing to get all pompous about. It's funny because it means nothing. Oh, you're a political analyst. You analyze politics. You mean like everybody else in the country? That, that's all. Anybody can observe politics and analyze it. You're a, no, you're a political opinion haver. That's what you mean. That's what that means. You, you're somebody with an opinion about politics. So you're getting pompous about having opinions about, excuse me, excuse me. I'm, I'm a person with a, I'm a person with opinions about politics. I think I know what I'm talking about. I think I'm an expert here. Okay. I have opinions. I'm an opinion haver about politics. All right. So I think I know. I think I know a thing or two about this subject. I've had opinions about it for a long time. Okay. Uh, and it turns out her opinions were totally wrong. So once again, the political analyst class was totally, completely, catastrophically wrong. They were wrong about everything. They were wrong in every way about everything. 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 And that will not stop them from being wrong again the next time. That won't slow them down for a moment. There won't be a moment of introspection. There will not be one single fraction of a second where women like this stop and go, hmm, wow, I I was really off on that. How did that happen? Won't happen, not for a second. And I do want to say this. When When you watch that video... And you see this repugnant woman cackling like a witch, uh, totally confident in her own intellectual superiority. And then you consider how devastated she must be right now. You're probably tempted to take pleasure in her suffering, right? You're likely tempted to delight in her pain and misfortune. When you think about the fact that when when you think about her recording that video and then you imagine if only we could have been there to see it. But you imagine what she, how she was reacting and how she was feeling like four or five hours after that video was posted. And just the total devastation that she was experiencing. When you think about that, it, it brings you pleasure. Great pleasure. And, uh, and I want to assure you that, that, that that's good. You don't have to feel guilty about that. You don't have to feel guilty about it. You should feel it. You should actually find joy in the humiliation and disgrace of people like this. You should. It is good and moral. To, it is a healthy reaction, okay? If a smile comes across your face when you consider how utterly miserable this person is right now, that is healthy. That is good. When you... when it, when it it, it, it warms your heart to consider that this woman probably hasn't slept 
okay, in three days. She's been up crying all night for three days. She's had no sleep. And that warms your heart to consider that. And that is good. It should. It should. It really should. To desire that a person like this suffer is to desire justice. And this is really important to me. It's, 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 it's a, a point that very few people will ever make because, because for the obvious reason that it's, it makes you sound cruel or whatever. But it, that's justice. That's what justice is. Justice is when a person gets what is coming to them, when they get what they deserve. That is justice. That is what justice It's literally what justice is, is to get what you deserve. Should we not desire justice? Is it embarrassing or wrong or somehow is it like a guilty pleasure when you desire justice? No. You should desire that. Um, we should be happy about it. We should find joy in justice. And somewhere along the line, we got it into our heads, especially we Christians got it into our heads specifically, that it's somehow unchristian to actively wish for the suffering, for suffering to befall evildoers. Like it's an unchristian thing. Which is an odd position for a Christian to take, considering the Bible is full of prayers for evildoers to suffer misfortune. That's like half the Psalms. Maybe not half of them, but it's a lot of them. Um, and uh, it's it, it, because it's a prayer for justice. It's, it's not, you're not the one, there's not something wrong with you when you see that video. You're like, you know what, I, I, I'm glad she, I'm glad she, she got what she was coming to her with an attitude like that, and I'm glad. That's not something wrong with you when you feel that way. You should feel that way. Of course you feel that way. Um, justice. And uh, now, here's where it, ver- it, it, it veers off into something that is unchristian and that is bad and sinful. Would be if... if you don't want her to ever change, and you just want her to be this miserable cretin uh, for the rest of her life. You know, if that's what you want, then yeah, that's that's unchristian. But what the reason why justice is good, the reason why it's good when suffering befalls evildoers, the reason is that number one, it's just it's inherently good because it is justice. It is it is somebody getting what they are owed. Um, but also, that's the only chance at any kind of redemption. So I'm glad with an attitude like that that she's suffering. I also, if it were, if if there was a, an update video a month from now, two months, a year from now, and she's changed her ways and she says, you know what, I I made that video. I'm embarrassed by it. I sh- I I've, I've you know I'm, I'm I'm I was totally wrong and I've. I've been walking around with all this hatred towards Trump supporters and half the country and feeling like I'm better than them and I'm and I'm sorry for that and I've and I've I, and I've changed my ways and you know what I'm a, I'm a happier person now. If she put that video out a year from now, she put it out next week. I would find great joy in that. I would I would celebrate that also. That would be an amazing thing. I would love that. Um, but probably not going to happen, unfortunately. And certainly not ever going to happen if these kinds of people never suffer the consequences of their miserable behavior. And when you act like a miserable, awful person, miserable, awful things should happen to you. And I hope they do. And I hope that it inspires you to not be miserable and awful anymore. That's what I hope. Um, so let's not, uh, let's, let's, uh, let us, let us all delight in justice. Uh, that's, that's my message. Let's talk about something that affects all of us, taxes. The October 15th deadline has passed, and if you're not prepared, you could be in for a world of hurt. Do you owe back taxes? Are your returns still unfiled? Did you miss the deadline to file for an extension? Well, now that we're past October 15th, the IRS is probably gearing up for some aggressive enforcement, and trust me, you don't want to be on their radar. We're talking wage garnishments, frozen bank accounts, or even property seizures. It's not pretty, folks, but before you start panicking, there's still hope. Tax Network USA has helped taxpayers save over a billion dollars in tax debt and filed over 10,000 tax returns. These guys specialize in reducing tax burdens for hardworking Americans like you. Look, I get it. Dealing with the IRS is about as fun as a root canal, but ignoring the problem won't make it go away. So here's what you got to do. Don't wait any longer for a complimentary consultation. Call today at 1-800-958-1000. 
or visit their website at tnusa.com slash Walsh. Their experts will walk you through a few simple questions to see how much you can save. That's 1-800-958-1000 or visit tnusa.com slash Walsh today. Don't let the IRS take advantage of you. Get the help you need with Tax Network USA. Just when the left and the first DI presidential candidate thought their week couldn't get any worse, well, the weekend is here, and Am I Racist is streaming exclusively on Daily Wire Plus. Did you catch that? This is important. The only way you can watch me in the box office hit comedy and now the number one documentary of the decade is with a Daily Wire Plus membership. Not a member yet? No problem. Head to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code TRUMP for 47% off a new annual membership. And yes, that includes a Leftist Tears tumbler to sip from while watching Am I Racist? We've got everything covered but the popcorn. So don't wait. Watch Am I Racist this weekend only on Daily Wire Plus. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code TRUMP for 47% off new annual memberships. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. So there has been uh, some controversy uh, swirling around me recently. And uh, I know that may be surprising. I'm not the sort of person who normally invites controversy. I don't like controversy. I tend to shy away from it. As you know, I'm the kind of guy who prefers to get along with people. Matt Kumbaya Walsh is what they've always called me. Friendly, wholesome figure. The new Mr. Rogers. That's the other thing they've always called me. So the outrage directed at me over the past few days has shocked me uh, just as much as I'm sure it shocks you. It all began the morning after the election. uh, And in my usual thoughtful way, I was trying to think of something to say a public statement to make that might help calm everybody's nerves and reassure our Democrat friends that everything's going to be okay. So this is what I came up with. I tweeted, I tweeted this, quote, now that the election is over, I think we can finally say that, yeah, actually, Project 2025 is the agenda, LOL. Now, for some reason, this post seems to have upset a lot of people. And I have no idea why, because I said LOL after all. And I didn't mean it like a nasty LOL. This wasn't an evil, wicked witch type laugh. It was like a warm, hearty chuckle. I would have actually written WHC for warm, hearty chuckle, but I wasn't sure if anyone would be familiar with that acronym, so I went with LOL. But even LOL was not enough to prevent the outrage mob from assembling. And assemble they did. Now, there's probably no point in reading any of the thousands of belligerent and infuriated comments from leftists. You can probably imagine... But just to give you a brief glimpse, here are a few. One woman says, I hope you get excommunicated and mauled by a bear. Another says, castration for all of them. It was actually a recurring theme. Another comment says, you're a retard and I hope you're castrated. Now, we know that leftists are big fans of castration. In fact, they're such big fans of it that I'm not sure if these comments are meant to be negative or not. Are are they threatening me with castration or kindly inviting me to be castrated? To them, castration is a beautiful, sacred ritual. So... That's a bit confusing. These other comments are not so confusing, though. Another leftist replies, I don't care if it gets me banned. I hope Matt Walsh and all the Project 2025 Nazis die. It's another theme that emerged. Uh, Here's another comment. It says, that's fine. We'll just burn the continental U.S. and try to kill you again. I have to say, burning the whole continental U.S. seems like quite a chore. Um, Also not necessary, because we're going to set everything on fire with global warming anyway. Part of Project 2025. So uh, don't waste your effort. And then there was also this comment, I hope to one day see you either hung, shot, or so brutally assaulted you can't enjoy life anymore, and I kind of hope I'm the one who gets to make any of those three happen. Burn in hell, fascist dog. So there were quite a few responses just like that, directly threatening to kill me, and I did reply to the guy who sent that last tweet. His, His account ended up getting permanently banned, sadly, so I'm not sure if he saw my reply. Uh, I'll just reiterate it here, just in case. If you're listening, I just want you to know that uh, you can hope for my demise, but I think what will happen most likely instead is that I will continue to live a prosperous life where I am both happier and more successful than you while you wallow in your misery until you die alone and few will ever know that you existed or care that you're gone. That's what's likely to happen. That's the most likely scenario is that I get to keep living my amazing life while you are stuck in your awful and miserable one. But we'll see what happens. Uh, Who knows? The tweet also caused a stir over on TikTok, and the uh, the TikTokers are are, are not happy. Uh, I'm sorry to report. And um, so here's just one uh, example. You know Matt Walsh. You know Project 2025 evangelical extremist wacko Matt Walsh. You know Matt Walsh, the one who's been giving 
frequent arguments that women should no longer have the right to vote, or young people, that just the man in the household should have the right to vote, that Matt Walsh, the Matt Walsh that was all about Project 2025, why it's so important, why it's such a good thing, why it's so important. Well, anyway, he just posted on X. And here's what he said. Now that the election is over, I think we can finally say that, yeah, actually, Project 2025 is the agenda. LOL. We were trying to tell you all, Trump was lying. Yes, that's right. I am an evangelical who thinks only men should vote. Um, I frequently made the argument that only men should vote, according to this person. You heard it from her first. It's breaking news to everyone, including me. Um, And there are many videos on TikTok just like that one. But my one sentence tweet was not just a source of outrage on Twitter and TikTok. The mainstream media also joined in the fun. In fact, multiple major outlets wrote entire news articles about the tweet. Here are a few headlines. Rolling Stone uh, says, Republicans celebrate by admitting they can't wait for Project 2025. Axios uh, has this headline. Trump's MAGA allies gloat Project 2025 is the agenda. Daily Mail, MAGA stars gloat that they can finally admit Project 2025 is the agenda as Bannon names first targets. MSNBC, in the wake of Trump's win, Project 2025 becomes newly relevant. Newsweek, MAGA says Project 2025 is the agenda. Et cetera and so forth, you get the idea. So in summary, uh, there's been the whole lot of confusion and anger and hysteria that seems to have been caused by my tweet about Project 2025 and I never intended for any of that to happen. In fact, I, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that it did happen. I'm, I'm a little embarrassed by it. Uh, so, so let me clarify a few things. Um, the media and the left are all reacting to my statements as if I'm actually going to be in the upcoming Trump administration. They're treating me like an actual official in the next White House, you know, because it, it would be a really strange thing if I'm just some podcaster talking and they and they make whole headlines about it. Uh, that's really weird. And so they're, it's, so it's, it's almost as if they're treating me like I'm some sort of government official. And they're right. Um, I can announce today that I will be in the Trump cabinet. Um, and I know the news media is watching this right now. Feel free to report this news. I'm going to be in Trump's cabinet. I have been offered the position of Secretary of State as well as Secretary of Defense and HHS Secretary and Secretary of Agriculture, of course, and of course, the position of Attorney General. Uh, Trump said I could have, he called me up and said I could have any of those positions I like. And I said, you know what, sir, I'll take them all. I want all of them. And he agreed, because it makes his job a lot easier. Now he doesn't have, that's like five jobs off the table, because I'll just do them all. And I do have, I think, the right experience for all those jobs. Um, I have watched, I mean, I've watched over, over 40 episodes of Law & Order. More than 40, which is like a couple of whole seasons worth, which qualifies me to be attorney general. Um, as for secretary of agriculture, I did grow a tomato plant um, last spring. And as for the others, I'm sure there are probably YouTube tutorials that will help me learn the basics. How hard can it really be? These are government jobs after all. Because there's, and there's no way I could screw it up worse than the people who currently hold all those jobs. So that makes me feel good too. Will we really be enacting Uh, Project 2025. Yes, I've already made that clear. In fact, I've been honest about this the whole time. I never lied. I've been telling you about Project 2025 for months now. I even made, and if you've been watching the show for a while, you know this, I made a whole website about it. And if you didn't hear, the website is project2025.com. I designed it myself. I slaved away for days upon days designing a state-of-the-art website just to let everyone know about Project 2025 and what it will entail. And you can go to project2025.com right now to learn more. If you're in the media listening to me and and, and dutifully reporting on whatever I happen to be rambling about right now, make sure to include the website in your reporting. This is a quote from me, a Trump official. Also, to anyone else in the audience, if you see anyone on social media panicking over Project 2025, make sure to leave the link in the comments to project2025.com. It's all there. I'm the one who made the website about Project 2025. So you know what? I take back my apology. 
Don't call me a liar or accuse me of trying to bury the truth. How dare you? I did more to raise awareness about Project 2025 than any of the people attacking me right now. I was 100% honest the whole time. I couldn't be more transparent. And you can see for yourself again at project2025.com. Make sure to click all the links. It's all in there. It's all real. It is happening. I tried to tell you. And now you're all going to be rounded up, bound in chains, and thrown into the sea. That's the very first item on the Project 2025 agenda. It says it right there. Agenda item number one. Trump's enemies shall be round up and cast into the depths of the sea. You'd know that if you did your research and went to project2025.com. If you didn't listen, if you didn't read the literature that I provided for you, and now you're complaining, that's your fault. And for that, you are today canceled. That'll do it for the show today and uh, this week. What a glorious week it was. Have a great weekend. Talk to you next week. Godspeed. The executive producer of The Matt Wall Show is Sean Hampton. Our associate producer is McKenna Michaelis. The show is directed by Mark Jones and Trey Miller. Our production manager is Austin Michaelis. The show is edited by Jeff Tomlin. Our lead audio engineer is Mike Cormina. Our audio engineer is Ryan Reese. Our hair and makeup artists are Cherokee Hart and Andrea Bauer. Our wardrobe stylists are Kristen Galarraga and Cameron Lasko. Our director of post-production is Matthew Kemp. Director of production operations is Pavel Vodasky. Our chief broadcast engineer is Jeff Govin, and our assistant broadcast engineer is Allegra Rohr. Our lighting director is Keith Duggan. Our playback operators are CJ Hickish and Finn Pope. Our show assistant is Holly Merritt, and our production assistant is Mike Moran. Executive in charge of production is David Wormus. Executive producer is Jeremy Boring. The Matt Wall Show is a Daily Wire production, copyright Daily Wire 2024. Hi, this is Andrew Clavin. If you like American flags and automatic weapons and shaking your fist at homosexuals while fighter jets fly over in formation, come to The Andrew Clavin Show. We don't have any of that. But we will be making fun of idiots and praising God and laughing our way through the fall of the republic. It's like an insane asylum for happy people. That's The Andrew Clavin Show right here on Daily Wire Plus.